Here we go. Um, congratulations on your 600 years. Um, I, I've got a bit of an anniversary this year as well, 25 years in broadcasting. As you say, I've, had, I've been very lucky to cover some amazing stories. I've been, you know, I've been I anchored coverage on wars and, uh, you know, financial crises, all sorts of things. And when I was approached about covering the royal wedding, I have to say I was in two minds because those sorts of stories are they're easy to understand and to explain. But I, I had an issue with the royal wedding. I, I knew it was going to be big, but I didn't necessarily know why. I, as a journalist, our job is to explain stories and to take information and give it back to you to make judgments. But I found it difficult to explain why the royal wedding would be a big story. Um, having said that, it sort of niggled away at me, and that, in the end, was why I wanted to do it, because I wanted to find out why there was this big interest. And it was quite good fun. We got some good access, so there's me wandering through Buckingham Palace, uh, drifting onto camera. The palace won't like the fact that I was actually in that. But here I am in the Royal Mews, uh, reporting on the carriages, all the preparations for the royal wedding. Uh, it went a bit far when I ended up in Windsor Great Park, chasing the royal florist around trying to work out what his colour theme was going to be. But that video was actually one of the most popular videos on our website, and it just shows the frenzy around that particular event. But for me, there was one uh, moment, really, that uh, I really remember and was remarkable. And it's a bit of a bad shot, but it was the night before um, the wedding, and this was the Mall, Buckingham Palace, behind me. And it was just absolutely wild. It was like a festival. And people weren't drunk, they weren't on drugs, they were just having an amazing time. And I went around this group with a microphone, it was a live shot. Uh, there was a group from Seattle, there was a group from Sydney, there these were British, and they were just having an amazing time. And I had that gut feeling that you get when you get a really, really big story. Recently, you know, when Margaret Thatcher died, you get this gut feeling, it's big, you can't screw it up. I felt like that on that occasion, but what really sealed it for me was this moment the next day, after the wedding, and this is the Mall, and this line of police walking very slowly down the Mall, a very civilised crowd walking slowly, very excited. But again, I still had this question. It was, um, why are a million people, there are a million people there, the police reckoned, and a record TV audience coming to see a couple they don't know appear on a balcony of a house uh, that they've never been in? And it, it niggled away at me still, so one thing led to another, and I was appointed royal correspondent. And it's been an amazing sort of uh, period for me, and there's no doubt in my mind that the royals uh, are the biggest story in the world. I know it's a big claim, not necessarily the most important, but they are the biggest story in the world, and I'm going to try to give you the ed evidence for that. If there is a, a repository of global information, it's Google, and there's no better comparison. So what I did earlier this week was put in a uh, royal wedding 2011, uh, you get 127 million results. So how do you compare that to another event? Well, for me, the most comparable event is Obama's first inauguration. It was a historic moment, the first black president, most important <coughs> job in the world. Uh, so I put in Obama inauguration 2009, and you get 14 million results. It's not necessarily scientific, but there's something else that you can, you can go on to Google Trends, it's called. It's a measure of interest, and it's just, it, it basically rates the number of searches. And so the, the star of the wedding, of course, is always the bride. Uh, Kate Middleton, I put her in. This is the graph from 2009. So it starts with your inauguration. And this is basically a, it's indexed, and it shows the level of searches. But that first peak is the engagement. Then you had the royal wedding, and then that actually the big peak was when those holiday pictures came out last year. <laughs> I'll leave it at that. Um, and then you compare her to the rest of the royal family, the Queen, Charles, William, Harry, and she's the blue line, and the only one that really comes close to her is Harry, actually. I mean, <laughs> the Queen is the bigger, you know, she's one of the few, you know, icons of modern history, and she's going she's to, you know, she's going to go in the history books, and the rest wouldn't be there without her. But certainly in our era, I'd argue that she's, you know, she is of more interest. So you take Kate Middleton out. I use the term Kate Middleton because it's the name that is inevitably used for her on Google. It's very hard to sort of leave the name that made you famous. Um, so I wanted to compare her to other modern icons. Uh, the red line is Barack Obama. 
So that first bit is around the election, the inauguration. And then sh he falls flat. Duchess is rising. You see the peaks there. Nelson Mandela doesn't really register. <laughs> Pope Benedict doesn't really register. Um, you know, it's extraordinary, really. You have to go to the pop culture world to get anyone that's comparable. And the biggest name in pop culture is a certain Justin Bieber. <laughs> um, and he's obviously bigger, but he's falling down a bit. And she, if you imagine, all of these other people, their positions will disappear after time. But Kate's story is just beginning. I mean, she's not a princess yet. She's um, not a queen yet. Her story is just starting. The rest of them, they will fall away. And if you look at all these peaks, they're basically stories, bits of information that come out. And we get so much information about the others. We know so much about them. We know about uh, Obama's politics, the Pope's beliefs. You know, Justin Bieber, we know everything about. You know, all that information. He just tweets everything. Uh, the Duchess, we don't get much on. So when there is a bit of information, it, it, it's of more interest. And that's a crucial thing about her. She is, I think, the biggest star in the world, but the person we know least about. And later on, I'll explain why I think that's quite important and what we can learn from it. And finally, uh, last piece of evidence. Uh, this is um, it's called Google Zeitgeist, and it's the big sort of project they have every year. And it's, it's a benchmark, really, of the searches over a year. And it's very anti keenly anticipated when it comes out. And the, the last one we've got is 2012. And she is the only living person in the global top 10. So I would argue that that makes her the biggest story in the world. The other stories come and go. You know, Olympics isn't going to be there next year. Um, iPad 3 certainly isn't going to be there next year. Um, so the more interesting question for me, the, 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 the thing that I wanted to sort of investigate was why. And I think it's, the story is the key thing here. It's a narrative. She is living the fairy tale. She's a, a middle-class country girl. Her mother was brought up in a council house. She met her prince here in these hollow grounds. Uh, she went to travel the world. She's now going to um, uh, give birth to an heir to the throne. It's a, it's a fairy tale. It's a story. It's a classic story arc. And the best way of engaging any audience is with a story. And she's done that. And there are some sort of tragic subplots in there as well. You have the nurse at the hospital, you've got Diana in the background. But that's the, that she's a very engaging story. You can dip in and out of it. So everyone knows her story. And the capital of stories is LA, Hollywood. And I went there after the wedding with them. It's this incredible moment, a red carpet moment. And you had the biggest stars in Hollywood and all the studio bosses all clamoring to meet them. And, you know, in Hollywood, if someone's trying to be your friend, you know they're a bigger star than they are. Uh, this was a scene inside this BAFTA event. You recognize a few of the faces, but look at them. They're literally clamoring to get their attention, the Duke and Duchess in the foreground. I mean, they're sort of a level above celebrity. But ever since the wedding, I've always wanted to look out the other way and at the crowd and see who's interested. And certainly in America, it's invariably women and girls, mothers and daughters, actually. And they all have one thing in common when you speak to them. I always speak to the crowds. And in the US, this is a Barbie princess. And this isn't Kate Middleton. This isn't the Duchess of Cambridge. But physically, she sort of couldn't be living up to their expectations of a princess anymore. And, you know, it, this is the country where anything can be achieved, dreams can come true. But actually, you can't become a princess unless you marry a prince. Uh, therein lies the attraction of Harry in the US. Um, <laughs> and I think there's a, a sort of frustration. And when they do meet them, they cannot get over the fact that um, they are nice, normal people. And they are. You know, they're, they're lovely, ordinary people. But there's this sense that how can they be that, these mystical figures? Um, in Canada, we were on this tour as well. We went there. It was more sort of a respectable sort of adoration because it's, you know, it's the Canadian royal family as well. And in Quebec, was really interesting. It's very anti-monarchy. But Kate and William always rate very highly in the polls. So they sort of rise above the institution of monarchy in a way. Uh, it was the same sort of thing in Jamaica as well. I went there with Harry. You know, a Republican movement, but actually fascination with Kate and William. Um, I went to the Solomon Islands with them at the end of last year. And this is the view that they would have had. So I was with Kate and William, and this is sort of uh, camera going in the other direction. As far as the eye can see, and it's, really, it's a poor country, and this was a cathedral, and it had a corrugated iron roof and no sides. 
And for them, you know, you speak to these people, it's, they're, you know, they're interested in the glamour, they're attracted by the whole story, but it's a, it's, a, it's a story of aspiration as well. They would dearly love to visit the UK one day. So it's about them, it's their connection. And I think in Britain, it's deeply ingrained in us. There's people from all over the world here. But um, we grow up learning about kings and queens, and we sort of know their family tree better than ours, possibly. We feel like we know their family. It sort of feels like our family, feels like we know them. And they're always there at those sort of big national events as well. We start associating the feelings of those events with them. I mean, there was the most remarkable Olympics last year, and it was an amazing story for Britain, completely euphoric. And Kate, William and Harry were there all the way through. They even um, expressed it for us. This picture was everywhere at the time. And you start, you know, that euphoria, you start associating with them. And I think they are some sort of societal glue. They represent us in some sort of way. And we needed, you know, the wedding. We needed the Olympics. We've been let down in recent years. And, you know, you know if you think about the amount of scandals we had in politics, in, relig you know, in the churches and, you know, in the media... <laughs> We've been let down by institutions. And I think, actually, they live up to everything expected of a prince and princess. And if you want to follow this story, you, you, you can. You can follow every single update. I mean, I was in Nottingham last year. There's me behind them. This is what they face. And when people are talking to them, they are filming it. They are, you know, within moments, that's out there in the ether, being discussed, dissected, everything about them. If you want to follow their everyday lives, you can. I mean, in my day, you had to wait a week for the magazine. Nowadays, you can follow every single moment. This is a scene from further back. And, you know, they're under more media scrutiny than anyone else has been ever. She's the biggest star in the world. She's under more media scrutiny than anyone has ever been in history. And just to, ex you know, really express the point, um, oh, we've lost the picture, but I was in um, the Solomon Islands in the cabinet and they were going around meeting the cabinet ministers, and as they were doing so, they had their iPhones recording the conversation. I mean, another perspective on this incredible story. So you get this constant narrative, and you start feeling like you know them. But this is my point. You don't know this person. She's, she's very, very professional. She makes what she does look easy. I know peop some people think she has an easy job. It's very hard to look that natural when you are, you know, you've got a bank of cameras in front of you. She doesn't give any information away. She's a very private person. We don't know, I've met her lots of times. I don't know what her dreams are, her sort of politics. I don't know what frightens her. Other stars, we do know about that. And I think actually what we've done is almost fictionalize her. And I think, because there's nothing to contradict what we think of her, we start, I mean, if you imagine a story as a narrative, you need to know the protagonist to make the story work. And when you don't have the information about her character, I think we've actually sort of filled the void with our own values. So if you present this picture to people, I did this to a few people at work, everyone says different things. Some people say nice smile, uh, clothes, you know, nice character, privileged, uh, not interested. But actually what I think what she's doing, she doesn't give anything away about herself, but she's actually telling us something about ourselves. So if you look at that and you, your automatic reaction, I think it says something about your values. And it depends on where you're from, how you've grown up, how you grew up, sort of how you were parented, I don't know, all sorts of things. But going around the world, I think it depends. But I think, effectively, why she's so, she is interesting, and she's interesting because she tells us something about you. Thank you.